Welcome. Thank you for joining Snow Isle Libraries for Open Book with David B. Williams. Your mics are muted. Use chat to ask questions. We'll use chat on our end to share links to any lists and websites mentioned today. Look for them at the end of the program. David B. Williams is the author of Home Waters, A Human and Natural History of Puget Sound, as well as numerous other books exploring the intersection of humans and the natural world, especially here in the Pacific Northwest. His background includes a degree in geology and time spent working as an environmental educator at the Canyonlands Field Institute. He leads walking tours around Seattle and works as a curatorial associate at the Burke Museum. David assembled a list of books that inspired him as he wrote Home Waters. If you'd like to read more about the natural world and history of the Pacific Northwest, a link to this book list will be posted in the chat at the end of the program. Are you planning to add the works of David to your personal library? Support local independent bookstores with your purchases. Find a bookstore near you at bookshop.org. This event is being recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel with captions in a few days. Check our website often for additional opportunities to hear from authors and illustrators. Now, let's meet David B. Williams. Exciting, it's great to have see people and thank you for the introduction and for setting this up and to Leah and Robin for taking care of the technical aspects of this. Um, it's always a pleasure for me to talk about the place I love Puget Sound. So what I want to do is do the sort of classic Zoom thing we've all gotten used to. Um, I'm going to do a share screen. So let me see if I can make technology work. Do that. Do that. And go to full size. Great, and get rid of that. So, and again, an honor and pleasure to be speaking to you. Uh, let me just tell you a little bit more about myself. Um, I grew up in the Seattle area, have lived here for most of my life. And for the last 20 plus years or so, I have been basically a full-time, mostly full-time writer. And what I'm always interested in as a writer is the intersection between people and place. How do we impact the landscape around us and how has the landscape influenced us over time, as well as the interaction between people, plants and the landscape. And I've done this through a variety of books, um, anything from Too High and Too Steep to a book looking at geology to the present one, Home Waters. And what I'd like to do today is start with a short reading about five minutes long from based on the introduction of home water. So I will start that with um, what a beautiful view, a sunny day, just like today. This looks exactly like Puget Sound is. So I'll start. In the summer of 2018, I grieved with millions of people around the world. Our collective sadness focused on a 20 year old mother, Tlaqua, one of a dwindling number of orca who regularly visit Puget Sound. On July 24th, Tlaqua had given birth to her second child, a daughter who died within 30 minutes. For the next 17 days, she carried the six foot long body of her dead offspring on a journey of more than 1,000 miles. Finally, Tlaqua let her calf go. Our hearts broke. Then, two years later, on September 6, 2020, it was with much joy that whale researchers announced Tlaqua had given birth two days earlier. The healthy and precocious boy calf, dubbed J57, was born in the Strait of Juan de Fuca after an 18-month gestation. To paraphrase Emily Dickinson, hope is a baby orca in Puget Sound. Mourning the loss of a child is a natural response for humans and orca. Both species are smart, self-aware, and deeply connected to their families. Clearly, Talakwa, like us, had loved her daughter and did not want to part from her. And as we learned, her extended family tried to help by providing food for the grieving mother. Ecologists suggested that they might also have been mourning with her. Tlaqua and her family are members of a group of more than 70 orca known as the Southern Resident Killer Whales. These animals, which have evolved a culture and community unique to their home in Puget Sound, travel together, hunt together, and communicate using their own distinctive dialect. Solidifying their cultural affinity, the Southern residents also rely on the collective knowledge of their elders, particularly the matriarchs, who act as guides and teachers to their family members. Why shouldn't they also love and grieve together? 
And why shouldn't we also love and grieve with Tahlequah? Few animals are as sacred and iconic to Puget Sound residents as orca or in more dire straits. Habitat loss, disturbance from noise and boat traffic, exposure to an ever-increasing toxic mixture of pollutants and overfishing of their favorite food, salmon, have get pushed the southern resident population to a point where their very survival in Puget Sound is in doubt. For many who followed Tilakwa, their grief for her was compounded by their grief for the environment of Puget Sound and the way its degradation affects orcas and humans. If Tilakwa and her calf couldn't thrive, what did it mean for us? More than any other story, Tilakwa's loss crystallized the central environmental challenges of Puget Sound. The orca are suffering, the salmon are suffering, we are responsible. For most of my life, I've lived within a few miles of Puget Sound. I knew that I lived by troubled waters, but I did not fully grasp the magnitude of the crisis that had been rising around me, a tide submerging low island. Although I saw myself as someone deeply aware of my natural surroundings, I realized I simply hadn't paid close enough attention to the place I love and where I intend to reside for the rest of my life. I needed to take heed of all the people who have lived here, how they have related to the landscape over the millennia, and how their stories could provide a better understanding of the conditions now shaping the lives of modern residents. Furthermore, as a writer who is generally focused on stories about the land, I had not fully appreciated the water and those who dwell in it. Standing on the shoreline or riding a ferry and seeing only the surface of the water, which tends to appear untainted and beautiful. I had long failed to see the interconnected lives of the plants and animals beneath, and to understand how they sustain and breathe life, both metaphorically and literally in Puget Sound. The effects of human activity reach deep beneath the surface. Our actions, their lives, our lives. We cannot cut one strand without unraveling the many connections that link us. This book, then, is my way to rectify my lack of understanding of the cultural and ecological history of my home waters and to provide a resource for others. The more of us who know and care about this place, the more momentum we can build to change our ways. We have reached a critical confluence with the waters of Puget Sound. Paraphrasing Wallace Stegner, is this a native home of hope where we can create a society to match its scenery, or will we succumb to baser values? Since I began writing Home Waters, my own enhanced appreciation and understanding of Puget Sound's incredible diversity, beauty, and potential for recovery have led me to believe that the most valuable assets of Puget Sound are not the resources we have long extracted, but the relationships that real residents can make with this place. Learning from the past is central to forging and nurturing those relationships and to creating a positive future for all Puget Sound and all its inhabitants. By taking this journey, I feel I gained an extra dimension of sight. Now, when I look out over the surface of the sound, I can see deep into its history and the peopling of the landscape. Its residents travels by canoe, ferry, and steamer, their endeavors to carve out a living, and their fears of invaders. I can see deep underwater to lush forests of exquisite beauty and complexity to corpulent clams that can outlive people, and to fish whose annual spawning creates a spasm of desire, attracting uncountable numbers. I can also see into a future where I have hope. If the residents of Puget Sound hold this place to be special and unique, as I think we do, then we will recognize our responsibilities, not only to this generation, but to the generations to come, human and more than human. So that I hope gives you a little bit of a feel for where the book goes. What I want to do now is just tell you a little bit more about the book. And when I started working on Home Warners, I spent about five months interviewing people to try and understand what were the critical stories. I reached out to biologists, historians, tribal members. And one of the stories that I came up with, one of the aspects of it is what is Puget Sound? What is this body that we call Puget Sound? This area we see here in blue, the blue line is the watershed of Puget Sound, all the precipitation that falls within this area, which obviously over the last few days, week has been tremendous. All of that water ends up in Puget Sound. And this is the state's definition of Puget Sound, the watershed. So from Mount Rainier out to Cape Flattery to the Canada border, all of this is part of the sound because the state understands 
that whatever happens on the land also affects what happens in the water of Puget Sound, in that salt water, that relationship between fresh and salt water. This is what I would refer to as greater Puget Sound. What I think of as Puget Sound proper is the area south of Admiralty Inlet. And I think this is the definition that many people think of, all this lower body of water. The name comes from George Vancouver, May of 1792. He takes a right turn down this area, ends up setting, up, up stopping his boat just off of what we now call Bainbridge Island, sends his lieutenant, Peter Puget, south down to explore this un this waterway down here. And when Peter Puget returns to the vessel, Vancouver writes in his journal, to honor his exertions, I name it Puget's Sound. So the original Puget Sound was really just this area south of Tacoma um, was the original body of Puget Sound. That being said, the body itself, the body of water was long known and the oldest known name comes from the Lachute, from Lachutsi the native language of the people here. And it meant the water. And it was referenced not to a cartographic vision of the world, say a, one of the settlers, but more a reference of a relationship, as in we are of the salt. Our lives revolve around the salt water. And they in fact saw people who lived outside of the salt water, who lived in the fresh water as not as good of people. In fact, they had an insult. An early ethnographer in this area came across an insult for if you wanted to sort of make your children act up, you'd say, oh, if you're a bad kid, you were like that yonder per person from yonder Issaquah. So there was this relationship between the people and the salt water that they lived in. So that was sort of a beginning, begins the book to think about what is this place? What's the geology? What's some of the ecology of this landscape? From there, I look at what I call the peopling of Puget Sound. How did people move into this area? And this story goes back at least 13,000 years. The oldest evidence in the Puget Lowland, the oldest widely accepted evidence, comes from over in Redmond, from a site of, that dates back, I said, to about 13,000 years ago on the shores of Lake Sammamish. And it was a stone a place where people came to find rock to make stone tools. And over time, those people adapted to the changing landscape and their lives became entwined with the landscape was here. The earliest European settlers were actually the Spanish. And so one of the things I thought was sort of interesting is to look at how do place names tell stories? So we have Spanish names up at the North End, Orcas, San Juan, Guemes, Harrow Strait, all of these connect to that Spanish story, which I think is often overlooked. Then the British arrive and we see many of the British names that come from Vancouver, Mount Rainier, Bellingham, places like that. Then we get the arrival of the next British group, which is the Hudson's Bay Company at the south end of the Sound. They add some names. Then we have the Americans arrive in the form of Captain Wilkes and his expedition. He leaves names on the land. So how did these people live in the landscape? How did they relate to the natural resources? How did they relate to the different people who also inhabited this place? So that's one chapter. Another chapter then looks at the relationship between people and, if you will, their sort of love for land, their love for their home, their desire to protect the area that they called home. The idea was originally grew out of the forts at the North End, Fort Warden, Fort Casey, and Fort Flagler, the so-called Triangle of Fire built in the early 1900s. But then going back in time again, trying to understand how did the indigenous people live here? What are their stories? What is their relationship? How did they defend their place? So those two ideas are then woven throughout this chapter of how do we defend and protect a place that we love, which I still think we're trying to do in slightly different manner. So those are a couple of the human history chapters. I'll come back to another one in just a second. Then there are the natural history chapters. And those really focus on what I think are often overlooked animals. We, of course, probably most of us know about orca and salmon. And I wanted to look at animals that were just as essential to understanding the story of the sound as those that were often overlooked. So one chapter focus is on herring, which uh, one biologist described as the hub around which Puget Sound revolves. In that sense, it, that herring and sand, lance, and surf smelt are forage fish. 
And these are the fish that are eaten by larger things and eat smaller things. And herring are really central to that story of how do fish and other animals survive. As one person put it, if you don't have herring, you don't have orca in the sound. So they're that critical to understanding the story. But then there's also this incredible human story. And again, we think of salmon as essential to the Coast Salish people, but looking at archeological records going back 10,000 years, archeologists found that herring are just as ubiquitous and just as abundant in archeological sites. So there's this deep, deep record of the relationship between people and herring and that evolution of people and place on the landscape and the evolution of, of fish many of these herring, which are superbly adapted to where they live within the sound. So that's one story. A second story focuses on rockfish, a fish that prior to this book, I really knew nothing about. Beautiful, beautiful animals. And rockfish are, to me, the quintessential sound resident. There are 27 species in a single genus, Sebastes, meaning magnificent. They are found throughout the water column from the deepest parts of the sound. The sound goes down to 900 feet deep. You find rockfish throughout the water column throughout Puget Sound. And they are, they, excuse me, they really exemplify one of the key stories of, I think, of Puget Sound. And one of the key stories that gives me hope based on the work that I did on this book. And that is that we understand the biology of rockfish much better than we used to. We used to really have a very poor understanding. And that led to quite a problem because what happened is after the Bolt decision in, in the early 1970s restored the treaty rights to native people to half the fish harvested in Puget Sound, state biologists pushed push fishers to harvest rockfish, not understanding the biology. They thought that rockfish were fairly short-lived fish, like, like salmon, which have a, a lifespan of a couple to maybe six or seven or eight years. Turns out rockfish can live for 25, 50, 75, 100. The oldest known rockfish, 205 years old. The way they know is from something such as this. This is an ear, otolith or an ear bone. And just like with a tree, a fish puts down new layers on that ear bone every year. And if you get them and polish them, you can count those individual layers and find the age of your fish. But because we didn't understand the biology, we completely mismanaged the species and allowed that population of fish to be hammered and with an almost impossible means of reproducing and increasing the population. Now that we better understand them, we are better managing them. We see this throughout the sound. As biologists learn more about this place, we learn more about better management. So that ultimately is giving me hope into the, for the future of a better Puget Sound. Then there are Olympia oyster and gooey duck. Um, certainly two of the more better known or charismatic of our um, animals. Um, Olympia oyster, perhaps a little bit less known. This is our native oyster. They're the oysters that are about the size of a silver dollar. They're not the ones that most people eat. Most people eat the Pacific oyster, which is non-native. And then there's the gooey duck. Uh, when I saw this picture, I knew I had to have it in the book. It's one of my favorite pictures. It's my favorite picture in the book. I just, I love the look on these people. It's like, oh my God, look, I found this great thing, whatever it is. But what's interesting about gooey duck and Olympia oyster, and again, this is, gives me hope, is they exemplify, I think, a changing relationship between post-European settlement and modern, the modern residents of this area. Olympia oyster was the first big export from this area. Before salmon, before herring, before trees, Olympia oysters were being exported from this part of the world. And in exporting them, we did, those early settlers did what often happened is they exploited them. Way too many were taken and that population crashed. We see this with salmon, we see this with herring, we see this with Olympia oyster. And those population Olympia oyster are just starting to bounce back because of restoration by people who care about this. Gooey duck, on the other hand, even though it has a native name, gooey duck from the Lachute Seed meeting Dig Deep, was an animal that wasn't harvested terribly intensively until the 1960s, early 1970s, 
when they were discovered to live not just in the intertidal zone, which is where people always thought, but in the subtidal zone. You can go down to 300 feet depth in Puget Sound and find gooey duck, arguably the most abundant large animal Puget Sound. And the difference between them is this, is that modern gooey duck are managed very heavily with a sustainable way, with stewardship in mind. And that to me is a fundamental change in how we relate to the natural resources. We no longer look on natural resources as something to exploit. We now look upon them as something beautiful, something that we desire, something that needs to be sustained, something that we need to have better stewardship. And again, that gives me hope, that changing relationship to place. And because of that changing relationship, we've seen many new rules and regulations over the last 15, 20, 30 years. And arguably Puget Sound is in better shape now than it has been in many, many years. And then I end the book by looking at salmon and orca. Of course, they are, as I said, the iconic species of this area. But what I wanted to look at them, and I hope is done in a different way than I encountered, was to look at the life histories of these animals. How have they evolved in this place? Puget Sound is only 15,000, 16,000 years old since the ice retreated during the last ice age. Those animals come, came back into this area and adapted to this place, adapted to each other, adapted to the geology. And that has given them a resiliency. It's given to me, the way I think of it is their DNA of Puget Sound is within each of these animals. It's within their bloodstream. A perfect example to me is what happened on the El, out on the Elwha dams. When those dams were removed, salmon came back almost immediately. And as one biologist said to me, they did so because they have been doing that for thousands of years. They have battled through various barriers over time, this species. And so they have that ability to return. It's within their bodies. It's within their, their who they are. Our goal is to give them a chance to, ex to express that resilience. That is, to me, again, is hopeful that we know, understand this better. We can work towards that from a management point of view. It will not be easy. It will require a commitment and change and money and courage on the part of all of us. So let me back out and tell you, go a little bit more in depth on two of the chapters of the book. One looks at what I call Puget Sound as a maritime highway. And in particular, looking about how do people move through this body of water? We all know, those of us who live here, this is a very challenging landscape to navigate. And for the first many thousands of years, excuse me, 10, 12,000, 13,000 years, the, the primary means of movement was by water. And probably for much of that, probably the last 5,000 years or so, once the cedar forest became the dom a dominant ecosystem, the boat that people used would have been a canoe. And I love this image by Alfred Bierstadt because I think he captures the essence of Puget Sound through time. Not only does it have this beautiful mountain and the incredible forest and the water, but the sound had, and the people who lived here had lives that revolved around canoes. And those canoes were the sinew that bound together the sound, that allowed people to live anywhere and still keep a connection to each other, to different communities. So it's what wove together the world of Puget Sound. And over time, those, the, peop the indigenous people developed superb adaptations in their canoes. Out on the coast, in the big water, they had what would, could be called a war canoe. These are the big classic ones. It might be 50, 60 feet long, just astounding boats. Within Puget Sound itself, which is relatively benign, if you think about it, from a navigable waterway, it doesn't get terribly cold, doesn't get terribly hot. We don't have that extreme of weather, at least used to, climate change is another issue. The big issues, understanding the tides here and understanding the currents, but with that knowledge, which would have been gained through experience, you can move pretty easily through this area. The two dominant canoes were the freight canoe and the trolling canoe, each one for a different purpose, one for carrying goods, one for out when you're in search of food um, out in the waterway. 
Interestingly enough, there was a fourth type of canoe in this area, and that was the shovel nose canoe. This was the canoe used by those Issaquan people, the people up on freshwater, up on the rivers around here. So the canoe was essential to the world of the people here, the indigenous people for thousands of years. Then in 1835, everything changes with the arrival of this vessel, the beaver. The beaver was owned by the Hudson's Bay Company, who were the first settlers in this area who arrived in the 1820s. And they want a boat to move up and down the waterway. So the Hudson's Bay Company has a ship built in London on the Thames River. It's outfitted as a sailing vessel, sails down, around, eventually comes to Fort Vancouver on the Columbia River, where it's converted to a steamship. And in 1835, that steamer plows down into Puget Sound, becoming the first steamship in this area. And that opens up the waterway. It becomes basically a traveling trading post for the Hudson's Bay Company um, in this area. And it plies the water for decades until eventually it crashes. But in doing so, it opens up the idea and reveals the importance and the advantage to having steamers in this area. You no longer have to rely on muscle or on wind power to move up and down the waterway. You can now rely on steam. And in an area where there's abundant fuel for your steamer, if you need wood, you just go pull up along the shore. There's wood everywhere. You were able to get that. So very essential to the story. And these steamers become what is known as the Mosquito Fleet. This is the sort of legendary armada of ships, maybe six, 700 different vessels um, in plowing the sound at any one point from the 1830s up until about the 19 teens or so. And there's, real no, there's really no specific definition of a mosquito fleet vessel. I always sort of like to use the, the definition that Justice Potter Stewart used for pornography. Can't define it, but you knew it when you see it. Same thing with one of these vessels. Generally, like the Hayek, they were pointy-ended, they were flat-bottomed, they were made of wood, they were steam-powered and propeller-driven. But you had paddle wheelers in the side, you had paddle wheelers in the back, you had ones that looked like they were going to sink, you had ones that looked rather much more substantial, you had ones ranging in size from maybe 19 feet, the smallest I came across was called the Polky. I love the name, to the 293 foot long Yosemite. And like canoes, they were the sinew that knit together the sound for the, for, for the residents, settlers moving in. Because again, you could live anywhere in Puget Sound. This is a list of more than 350 places in greater Puget Sound where a mosquito, fles mosquito fleet vessel docked. And what I did was I went through newspapers, and museums, and talked to people to find out, come up with this list. And these were the docks that stick out into the water, but they also could be areas where someone would just row out in a rowboat, a landing. And if you've spent time in Puget Sound, I'm sure you've seen evidence for these. And I know I have. You go along the waterfront, and there's a row of pilings leading out into the water. And it just sort of seems random. Why is that pilings there? Probably they were a landing spot, a place where one of these mosquito fleet vessels docked. So everywhere in Puget Sound, you had locations for these boats to go. Then you have the rise of the car and you have the death of the mosquito fleet. But there's still two vessels left. And I bring them up because I really like both of them. I just think they're beautiful, beautiful boats. The better known of the two is the Virginia Five. Um, a, classic pointy ender, flat bottom, steam driven. This boat was built in 1922, um, had a variety of areas it ran. Then in the 1960s, it was purchased by a group of steamship aficionados. They have restored it. It is beautiful. If you've never been, I encourage you to try and get on it. I'm often docked down at Lake Union, but also goes out and is available to rent. Just a lovely, lovely vessel. And really, to me, exemplifies just the beauty and elegance of many of these Mosquito Fleet vessels. 
Then there's my favorite one, which happens to be this one, the Carlisle II. The, the Carlisle II is actually five years older than the Virginia Five. Um, it's basically run the same route from Bremerton to Port Orchard, Port Orchard back and forth ever since it started. Uh, the one quibble some people have, and I just think they should, they should be quiet, is that it's diesel instead of steam. But for two bucks, you can go ride it. The, the Kitsap Transit Foot Ferry, hop on, go back and forth. It's about an eight minute ride across Port Orchard. But what's wonderful about it is it is a Mosquito Fleet vessel. And to me, it exemplifies what the Mosquito Fleet did and what it did for community. Because people who ride it, the times I've ridden it, clearly are people who work in Bremerton and are returning back to Port Orchard. They live on the other side. They don't have to drive. They can live where they want and still be connected. And so the Mosquito Fleet, to me, it really was this sort of combination of a UPS truck, Uber, a bank, a good place to get gossip. It, again, it's what helped bring together community around here. But with the rise of the um, cars, we then have a big change. And that, of course, is the development of the, of the um, ferry system here. And if you will, I just want to play a little song for you here. Just uh, what happens is the, the Mosquito Fleet, dot, as it fades out, you have the Puget Sound Navigation Company and the Black Ball Ferry Line develops a monopoly on the ferry system. Then in 1950, the Washington State buys the ferry system from Puget Sound Navigation Company and becomes Washdock. And probably the most famous, of course, it, part of it is Kalakla and the Black Ball Line. So let me just, I just want to play this song for you. It's about two minutes long. <laughs> On the Black Ball Ferry Line up in Seattle, where the sun shines, seldom shines up in Seattle, all the whistles go, and the bells go, and the ferry boats are chugging right along, right along. All the people love to ride the Blue Pacific on the Black Ball Ferry Line to Peace Pacific, while the whistles go, and the bells go, and the ferry boats are chugging right along. Of course, you're probably familiar with that uh, artist, Bing Crosby. Wonderful thing about Bing Crosby, even though he grew up in Spokane, um, is that his family had connections to the Mosquito Fleet. Um, they were, had been operators and owners of, of some of the vessels of it. And as I was working on the chapter, I thought my, I would set a goal and try and ride all the ferries in Puget Sound. And it turns out there's a lot more than I realized. I knew of the Wash Dot line that most of us are familiar with, but King, Kitsap County has a, a few, Pierce and Whatcom County have a few. These ones are wonderful, the little small little boats. Um, if you ride the Lummi Island Ferry, at least the times I've ridden it, they take your money on the ferry, not while you're in line. Um, King County has a couple. Then there are the private ferries. These were one, these ones owned by homeowners associations. And again, trying to be completist, I thought it'd be sort of fun to try and ride those. Interestingly, those who own the Decatur Island Ferry, they wouldn't even let me on their ferry. I, I tried to explain, I just want to ride your boat, but they wouldn't even let me on. The Gedney and Hat Island people, they let me on their ferry, but they wouldn't let me off their ferry on their island. Only Heron Island down in this little tiny island down in the South Sound, they were the only ones who let me on the ferry and off the ferry and then back on the ferry so I could leave. But it was also the one of my favorites because when I was down there waiting for the ferry to arrive, this truck pulls up and the person driving it offloads three John Deere riding mowers. The ferry arrives, people get on the John Deeres and drive them onto the ferry. I've never seen anyone drive a ferry, a, a, excuse me, a lawnmower onto the ferry. I thought that was sort of fun. Then there's Jetty Island at the South Sound. But the highlight for me of all of this was some time I spent with Marsha Morris, who's one of the captains 
on Washtot Ferry. And we, we rode together for a while and chatted. And Marcia told me one of the more profound asked things about the ferries, at least I thought most profound. She said, you know, I grew up in Eastern Washington. I was used to those big, wide open views of place. And when I came to Western Washington, I lost those views, at least hiking. We've all been hiking in the trees and we know we don't see stuff. But out on the sound, you have those big views. And she said, no matter how often I ride, and she, as you can imagine, captain rides a lot. She said, I still try to take the time to look. This, because to me, there's a spiritual aspect of riding the ferry. There's a spiritual aspect of the water. And I think that gets at the essence of one of the things I think is so important about the story of Puget Sound as a maritime highway. There's this very practical nature, get from point A to point B, but there's also this very spiritual aspect of it, this connection to place that grows through being out on the water. And one thing that I also like about this story of the Maritime Highway is I talked about the canoes early on. Well, there was a time for 50, 100 years or so when canoe culture had really sort of faded a bit. But starting in 1989 with the uh, state centennial, we started to see canoe culture return to the indigenous people. And over the last 20 years, we've seen that the um, that developed even more. This was the most recent gathering of canoes or a couple of years ago down at Alki. Um, and to see the boats come in, I mean, there were well over a hundred canoes paddling in to shore. Big, beautiful boats from all over Puget Sound, all over the West Coast really coming in. And as each canoe came in, a representative of the Puyallup tribe said, welcome, come to our land come share stories, come share food with us. And that's how I can envision how, how that culture developed, how that community developed through canoes, through Puget Sound as a maritime highway. And I just, it's amazing. If you ever have a chance to go to the canoe journey, I highly recommend it to see this and to feel that connection to place through the waterway, through these beautiful, beautiful vessels. So let me turn to, uh, with a, a short little talk about kelp. Kelp is one of those things, uh, one of those plants that I really knew nothing about. I think I had thought about it. I thought of it like this as sort of that spinachy material on the, on the, on the, growing along the waterfront. But kelp has arguably the longest storyline, the longest connection between people and place, between people and the natural world of any thing, every, any living thing in Puget Sound. And that goes to the, goes back to this, this, the opening up of North America, the movement of people into the, into this part of the world. Probably many of us are familiar with the idea that people came across the land bridge through this ice-free corridor into North America. Well, over the last few years, we've seen the development of what's called the Kelp Highway. And the idea is that people didn't travel overland, they traveled right along the shoreline here. Kelp generally grows in shallow water. Kelp is an essential part of the ecosystem, and it is an incredibly diverse part of the ecosystem, not just in the kelp itself, but also in the animals that use it. So as people would come to this air, would travel along the waterfront, travel along the kelp highway, they found a relatively safe way to travel. It wasn't, didn't have the cold of the inland. And along that waterway, along the shoreline there, kelp acts to attenuate waves. So it would have been a safer place and a good place to find food. One of the off ramps of that kelp highway would have been Puget Sound. So this deep, deep record of connection between people and the natural world. And it continued and continues. People still, the indigenous people certainly have this long-term record of it. Using the kelp bulb, this is from a bull kelp where they could make, uh, use it for steaming purposes. They, may, they use the kelp bulb for holding water. They use that long stipe or the stem for making rope. They use the leaves for flavoring. They use the leaves to put on the side of a canoe. So when you put your paddle down, it was quieter than if you put your paddle down on a very hard, surface. So this deep connection that's, that's persisted for thousands and thousands of years and continues to persist to this day. 
Um, and we see it also, interestingly enough, once European settlers arrive, because kelp grows in shallow water, on, often anchored on rocks, early maps, and this is an early map from the 1890s showing the Coast Geodetic Survey showing South Sound. If we zoom in a little bit on this little island, Ketron Island, you can see these curious little squiggles here. There's some squiggles there. There's squiggles around everywhere. That is kelp. And so kelp was used as a navigation aid, as something to avoid. In fact, Charles Darwin wrote about kelp on his voyage of the Beagle understanding that relationship between being a good observer and your connection to the place where you live or where you're visiting. In Puget Sound, we have an incredible range of kelp. Um, we, and that kelp grows in this forest with an overstory of giant kelp and primarily in our area, bull kelp, but also an understory of low growing plants. And this forest is really equivalent to the forest ecosystem on land, and it's just as important. And I would say just as beautiful, incredible to see. This is what's called a holdfast. This is, in essence, the sort of root that anchors that kelp plant to the, the, the substrate below. And kelp is a forest, as I said, an overstory, an understory, an incredible nursery habitat for just dozens and dozens of different animals from invertebrates all the way up to killer whales, orca, for some reason they like to wrap themselves in kelp, no one knows exactly why, but go to a kelp forest and you will find this diversity. As I said, it's a nursery, it is a safe haven, it is a food source. Kelp is so critical to the ecosystem because of the amount of carbon that it provides you may be familiar with the idea that the forest is sort of grows on salmon, in the sense that salmon swim back up when they're spawning, they die, they get eaten, they get excreted, all that nutrients go out into the forest. Kelp is the same way. All these different animals um, eating it, then it becomes part of their bodies. And so kelp is central to this ecosystem. It is, we've definitely seen a downturn in it. It's not doing as well, but again, this is another animal, another, excuse me, another species that people are working to restore. This intense focus on understanding that relationship between people and place. And this just incredibly beautiful ecosystem of Puget Sound. And I want to end by talking a little bit more about hope and sort of summarizing this idea of hope. As I said, to me, it is was one of the benefits of working on this book, of being out with biologists, being out with historians, being out with tribal members, being out with people who are focused on creating a better Puget Sound for all its inhabitants. They are helping us understand that the science that's critical for management. They're helping us understand the life histories of these species to see how their resiliency plays out and how it can play out. They are helping us to see that and are being part of that change from exploitation to stewardship and creating, as I said earlier, a Puget Sound that I think is arguably in better shape than it's been in a long time. We are incredibly fortunate. This place that we live is incredibly beautiful with incredible diversity, incredible resiliency. And to me, our, my goal as a writer was, I hope, is to reveal some of these stories, reveal the complexity, and help people develop those stronger connections to this place. I'll end by just saying two things. Um, I'll be happy to answer questions right now and with our, in the chat, but I also want to let you know if for some reason I don't answer your question now, please feel free to contact me. You can do it through my website. You can do it through my email. Um, uh, Anne said at the very beginning, and I certainly encourage you to buy books from your local bookstore. We have incredible bookstores um, in this area. I'm a big fan of both Edmonds and Kingfisher. But if you want an autographed copy, you can buy it through my website as well. Um, and I will stop the share if I can figure that out um, and open it up to everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, David. That was really, really fascinating. Um, and we've been getting some questions from people in the audience, and I have a couple as well. So we'll just go ahead and get started with 
the audience questions. So Deborah asks, can you address if not if if not already planned for your talk, and I think you might have a little bit, the names of the original Native Americans who lived in Puget Sound and if their progeny are still here today? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, if you talk to the different um, Coast Salish groups in this area, indigenous people, they will all say that they have lived here since time immemorial. And, you know, that is a, a different viewpoint than what, um, so, what Western science would say. It's the same way of phrasing, they've been here for 13,000 plus years. So I think people have continued, one of the things that's great about the sound, and I think is very interesting is, we think of the sound as one of the last places in uh, the low, what, lower 48 states, at least on the coast, for Europeans to visit. 1792, 300 years after Columbus sails. And yet it also, Puget Sound is probably one of the longest continuously inhabited places on the sound where we have archeological evidence that goes all the way through from 13,000 years ago up. And obviously the native people in this area, we have, uh, I forget the number of tribes in this area, but all of those people have this deep record, this deep connection to place and a variety of different names um, that have been, that the tribes go by now. So yeah, there's a very deep record. That's a great question. Okay, related to that, um the indigenous peoples that lived here early on. Michelle wants to know, she says, I live on Snakelin Point and I'm wanting to learn about the native population who were here on Whidbey first. Does your book go into that history much? Or if not, maybe you could point her in a direction to do some research. Yeah, I the um, I go spend less time on very many specific places. Um, I know that the, the Bainbridge Historical Museum um, that there's being worked on there. I mean, to me, one of the best, there are two, I think, very good books to read about Native people in this area at present. There's Cole Thrush's Native Seattle, and there's David Berge's um, Chief Seattle, which both look at the story of Seattle and the Native story here, but they do so in a way that I think really helps understand the bigger story of Native people in particularly in just around this part of Puget Sound. Um, I'm not as well, um, I'm not as up on areas outside the uh, Seattle itself, but those two books, which have both come out in the last say 15 years, really do take a new way of seeing and a better understanding and a more sympathetic understanding of the stories of native people here. So I would, I would highly recommend both those. Great, thanks. Um... The next question is, let's see. Now, are the canoe illustrations that you showed us earlier in your Home Waters book? Yes, they are in the book. Um, I believe they're in the book. That's my recollection of putting them in the book. I, while we're talking, I can, uh, while you ask the next question, I'll take a quick peek there. I know um, I wrote this book. Um, <laughs> I don't know if you can remember every little detail once you kind of put it to, to rest. Yeah. Um, Finley says, and this is related to another um, image that you showed during your talk, the one of the, the painting of the canoe in front of Mount Tacoma. Oh, there, fantastic. There are those canoes. Finley wants to know, or says, if the water is Puget Sound in that painting that you showed of the canoe in front of the mountain, how come the sunrise on the painting is on the west side of the mountain? Mount Tacoma equals Rainier. Yeah, Mount Rainier. Yeah, good, good observation. That's detailed. Uh, to tell you, you know, the, the challenge is um, Mr. Bierstadt actually never made it down to this area when he made that painting. Um, so it's a little bit of a, a fiction. Um, I think he I, he had heard about it, um, and so it's a little bit of imagination, you know, the, the upside and the downside of a painting. Um, so we got really technical on it. Uh, but I think just that idea, he's not alone. There's another painting at the, um, the Bierstadt paintings at the Rainier Club. There's another painting of Mount Rainier that's at the Seattle Art Museum that's in essence the exact same viewpoint. Um, but yeah, it's a good point. A little bit of artistic license going on. Yes. There. 
Um, Rocky wants to know, I'm interested in the origin of the names of islands and other geographic features. Do you have a resource that would be good to look at for that? Yeah, there's a couple of uh, good resources. Um, there's, I don't have it, there's a, an author named Richard Blumenthal, I think, who's written a book on place names in Puget Sound. Um, and then Edmund Meany also did a book about place names in Washington. I think Blumenthal's is better because um, it's more up to date and he brings back, he brings in more resources on the names. Um, I, it, I forget if it, it's, it, I believe actually focuses on the all of the Salish Sea, but I, I'm not positive. It may just be the names that are south of, of the Canadian border, but his book is, I think, the best in terms of the um, non-native names. If you want native names of place, um, that's a little more challenging. Again, Cole Thrush's book has a very good selection of native place names for the Seattle area. Uh, but there's also, and he has, a, and they all, his all come from a couple of ethnographers in this area, T.T. Uh, Waterman and um, Harrington, his name is escaping me right now, his first name, but they both have very lengthy descriptions of native place names in um, the, for the Puget Lowland area. Thank you. Kevin is interested in the geological history, particularly stories such as the Casanova landslide that caused the tidal wave on Hat Island. Wow, I do not know of the Casanova landslide um, about that. I do write in the book, I do try to really go into the sort of general geology of the sound and how did it form and what's unusual about it. Um, I do, but I've not heard of the Casanova landslide. I'm going to write that down and I want to know more. So I'm going to have to do some, do some searching. Going here for a, a new project. Yeah. Um, let's see. George, Thank you. <laughs> yeah, George is curious about peat bogs, um, which hold the ex excess carbon more than we thought. How much peat is there in the Puget Sound? area how much peat is that's an interesting question i don't go into it in depth in this this book but there's a fair there is a fair amount or there was a fair amount Tur certainly in urban places almost all the peat has been removed uh, from here even though we still feel the effects of it um, for example i live near an old um, peat bog i live near two old peat bogs puget or not, northgate is built on an old peat bog, but there's also a peat bog at 80th and uh, Greenwood, 80, yeah, 80th and Greenwood, 85th and Greenwood, just north of there, that is still moving the streets there because that water that's underneath the, con uh, the asphalt and concrete is slowly migrating as that land changes shape. And, and it's really strange to be there to see the streets drop down in. But we had a fair amount of peat um, because we were a glacial landscape. And, and peat is definitely something that's found in glacial landscapes. As that ice moved through the, sea, the Puget Lowland, it would have excavated out. So I think of it as acting like a big rake, scraping across the land, sort of creating this series of parallel ridges and valleys. And periodically it would excavate out a spot a little bit deeper as the ice retreated, maybe a chunk of it broke off and it and groundwater filled in that area, that peat, er that low area, maybe a little pond that over time would develop into a peat bog. Um, so we do have, a, a, we certainly had quite a few more than we have now. The only one that I at least is a little lake just north of um, SeaTac Airport called Tub Lake, or um, that it actually it is a still a peat bog um, where you can walk out and it, the, it's a floating mat of sphagnum moss and sort of like you're on a trampoline. Pretty neat little spot. Who knew? Um, let's see. We're, we're, we're going all over the place here. We've got some great questions from people. Um, Finley meant, says that their grandfather their, excuse me, their grandmother gave up her ticket from Seattle to the Yukon in the 1890s. All those who sailed were lost at sea. So she, she um, dodged that one there. Hmm. Any way to track down where that boat went down? And so then the broader question would be maybe where, what would be a good resource for shipwrecks in the yeah, that's, well, area? Yeah, the, 
There's the Puget Sound Maritime Historical Society. They um, have a good record of information. And if you go to the Tacoma Public Library, they have an A to Z list of ships um, with information about. So each one you can sort of, you can find the ship name and what they've done is they've assembled for each one a little, whatever little bit of information that they can. So sometimes it'll be a snippet from a magazine. Sometimes it'll be a snippet from a book. And oftentimes there'll be one ship will be listed several times with each of these little descriptions. That's, that's probably the, the best source that I know. So if you know the name of the ship, uh, then you have a chance to uh, track down that information. The other aspect, at least if it was a big event, is going to the Seattle Public Library's online database of both the Seattle Times and the Seattle PI and either typing in the date or the name of the ship and see what comes in the, comes up in those search engines. Um, you would find it. And then there's also a website called Chronicling America that has many, many newspapers and that would also be another way to search it. So it's, it's key is having the name of the vessel if you do. The librarian, of course, I love all this talk about different research resources. And we have a couple comments in chat of actually people suggesting some more resources. Uh, the person that lives on Snake Elm Point could do research on the local natives at the Island County Historical Museum in Coopville. That would be a great place to start out. And um, someone else, Pete, has also mentioned that Tule Loves Hebo. Tulalip's Hebold Museum may be a great resource for information on the tribes north of Seattle and facets of the native cultures. Um, I also noticed there's people wondering about the links that we're sharing in chat. Um, we can add those links to the YouTube um, when we get the YouTube video of today's talk up. We'll add the links in the description of the of the YouTube. So we'll just make sure that we we get everything there that was mentioned today because there's been quite a bit. Um, we have probably time for just a couple more questions here. Um, Joanne says, thank you for connecting all the layers of life that thrive and depend on the Puget Sound uh, through history, which thank I you. second that. This has been so fascinating and it feels like a really monumental undertaking to put together all of the pieces um, to put this story together. Um, it was fun. I feel real lucky. And it, I mean, to me, and I'm, I'm going to start to interrupt for a second. I mean, Don't go. To me, what... It, again, it just reveals the, just, as I said, the incredibleness of this place. I mean, both human and natural history of it. And um, I, I, I sort of, I guess I'll say one thing that people often ask me, you know, what's one way to connect to this place? One way to sort of further that. And to me, one of my hi highlights for me working on this book was the time I went and sat at Discovery Park in Seattle and watched a full tide change there going for getting there right a couple hours after high tide watching the tide go all the way out and watching the tide come back in and just to see the world that was revealed as the water pull, flows out backs out of that area and the sandy beach opens up in this incredible diversity there and it and it really sort of exemplifies i think one of the challenges as i mentioned in my introduction introductory reading is that we see the sound as this sort of beautiful clear body of water and there's just this incredible array of life that's underneath and i think taking the time to be out on the sound to walk the shores to learn its history um, to develop those connections that is what's essential i think to helping all of us become better stewards and more responsible for this place thank you so much for sharing that because that was actually one of my questions was what could people do who want to you know if they wanted to get to know their neighborhood or this area better so you've answered that one last question before we wrap up can you tell us what you're working on next do you have any projects underway i've been working uh for the last little bit with um my going back to my burke connect burke museum connections with uh, an invertebrate paleontologist from the University of Washington who worked at the Burke, and we're working on a book of fossils of Washington State, and not so much a guide to, but we take uh, 25 or so different 
fossils or groups of fossils and tell their story, tell a little bit about the geology, tell a little bit about the human history with a goal of helping people understand the sort of long-term story of geology in Seattle, the importance of people doing science and not just scientists doing sciences, science, but also people out who, who have collected and had this passion for this place. So uh, we're hoping that book will be out for lucky in the fall of 2023, 2022, what year, whatever year this is, yeah, next year, and it may be the spring of the following year, but that, I'm really excited about that, and there's gonna be some beautiful photos, I've been seeing the work that they're doing on the photographs, so I think that, that's really my, that's my next big project. Great, thank you, I'm looking forward to that one, that sounds wonderful. Um, we are at four o'clock, and I'm sorry to say, because this has been so interesting, and I think we could probably go on, like you mentioned earlier, for four hours talking about all of this, and it would be great fun, but we need to let everyone go. I, so I just want to thank you <laughs> so much for joining us today, um, and also thank everyone in the audience who took the time to come today. As we mentioned, if you want to share with friends or or um, rewatch yourself or go grab those links. The video will be available mm, in a few, it might be a couple weeks. We have a lot of different programs we're doing right now, plus the Thanksgiving holiday. So it might take a little bit longer than normal for that video to be available, but watch our YouTube site for that. I also want to mention that we have two more open book events here in 2021. Um, the Next one is December 2nd, Washington State Book Award winning author Jennifer Longo will join us at 4 p.m. She's going to be talking about her 2021 winning YA novel, What I Carry. Um, she's got a theater background and I've seen her sing on Instagram. So I think it's going to be a very lively program with her. And then finally, I, we, on December 7th at 6.30 p.m., we welcome G. Willow Wilson, co-creator of the Ms. Marvel comic series, and she was a 2020 Washington State Book Award finalist for her novel, The Bird King. So we're so excited to have wrapping up this year's of Open Book with David and two other local regional authors. Hope that you all can join us for one or both of those programs. You can find out more at our website at snowisle.org forward slash open book. Again, thank you, David, so much. Thank you, everyone. And everyone have a lovely evening. Thank you. Be well. Bye-bye. Yeah.